Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association. I'm Jamie Free, Professor of Global Politics and Director of the Center for Engaged Learning at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with a thoughtful and innovative teacher of international studies. These conversations are intended to help build a collaborative community of scholars who know that investing the work necessary to become a teacher worthy of their students' potential is worth the effort. This episode's conversation is with Dr. Esther Jordan, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of Faculty Success in the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Kennesaw State University in Georgia in the United States. This day is the former president of the Active Learning and International Affairs section of the International Studies Association. Among other wisdom, our conversation covers how adopting a classroom identity of the expert can actually get in the way of good teaching. Estee's assertion that layered pedagogy is a way to invite student narratives that create a community of genuine participants in class, and how taking the time for reflection, both individually and with colleagues, can change not only how individuals feel about teaching, but perhaps how teaching is conceived of across the academy. So Esty, welcome to The Teaching Curve. Thank you, Jamie, it's good to be here. So I like to start off by helping everybody understand kind of your institutional context, um, what your role is, and what kind of students are at your institution. So could you describe that context a little bit for us, please? Yes, so I'm at Kennesaw State University, and uh, we are a large public university. We have around 40,000 students. Um, We've been in a state of constant transition because we've gone from being a community college to an R2 university in just a few decades. Um, And so our student body is growing and changing and faculty are adapting as we go. Um, I'd say um, the other thing um, is I'm, my role is I'm at the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And so I've been doing that work as a faculty developer for over 10 years, um, since 2015 actually at Kennesaw State. Can you tell me a little bit about the ways that the student body at Kennesaw State influences how you approach your teaching? Absolutely. So because I came from an R1 to Kennesaw State, which at the time was R3 comprehensive university, um, we, I had to really shift my teaching at Georgia Tech where I was before the students, most of them were traditional students, full-time students. Um, And at Kennesaw State, most of my students work full-time or are taking care of dependents or both. And so I learned very quickly that I had to make what I was doing really worth their time. They're very practically oriented and they will only invest their time in something that they really think they're getting something out of. Um, So I've had to adapt accordingly and be really in touch with them in that way. No, it's fantastic. It's uh, one of the it, it demonstrates this real sense of empathy that I think is essential to being a good teacher, that you're, you're constantly thinking about who your audience is and how you can connect to their context, to what they're bringing into the class. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in that same vein, can you talk about how you developed your, your teaching identity a little bit? So are there, is there somebody who really influenced your teaching the, the way you approach being a teacher. Yeah, and I would, I'd kind of like to start with how I started teaching. Um, I really was trying to emulate my mentor in graduate school, Howard Wiarda, who is a pretty well-known comparativist. And he's just traveled the world. He is um, very dynamic and big personality, would stand on the stage in huge lecture halls and just entertain basically to teach. And I, when I was trying to do that, I was horrible because that's just not who I am. <laughs> and it took me several years actually to realize I didn't need to try to be him. And um, I, 
what influenced me the most actually was my colleagues at the Centers for Excellence in, T in Teaching and Learning, both at Georgia Tech and at Kennesaw State, um, who taught me to really connect to my students. Um, once I realized I could do that, um, I'd say Mary Ellen Weimer's um, book really has influenced me, especially the part about power sharing, um, which I think as political scientists, you know, we can relate to. Um, and I started actually when I would teach, I would go down next to my students, I'd get on my knees, <laughs> kneel to them and look at their work, of course, with comfortable distance and everything, but um, I would just get on their level as a kind of performance or a demonstration of that power sharing. Mm -hmm. And I found how powerful that was. Once I started doing that, they started reaching out to me, um, seeking mentorship, doing their work more, asking for help. Um, and so I really say Mary Ellen Weimer taught me that and it completely changed my teaching. And once I fell into that, all right, my strength is connecting one-on-one -on -one with my students. Even in big classes, I would do that. I'd go rotate around in lecture halls. I'd have them work in groups and I'd still get down to their level and I'd talk to the whole group that way. Everything changed. That's amazing. You know, one of the things that I often hear is how, the, is it, when thinking about the gender dynamics of teaching is how often female professors often feel that they have to project an extra level of authority in a class. And so mm -hmm. talking about evening that out, um, can you talk about how that worked um, for you as a person coming into teaching and trying to figure out your role relative to the students? Yeah, well, when I did that, I felt like a fraud. I mean, that's what my mentor did. Um, and I had constant imposter syndrome. I am not this, I will never feel like this super expert in my discipline. I know I, I am an expert, but I just, that's not how, that's not my identity necessarily. Um, and I started realizing that if I actually act more like a TA with my students, they learn more because I'm not trying to be this big thing. I'm just trying to actually help them learn. I mean, I went to undergrad at UCLA. And so, you know, a lot of big lecture halls. Um, I, most of my faculty members that I took the classes from were part-time faculty, adjunct faculty. I had no idea how to navigate that space and they were wonderful. Um, but when I took the UCLA tenured professors, they were huge classes. And honestly, I learned from the TAs. I mean, they were great expert professors, but I, I learned when I went and sat in the office with the TA. And so, cause then I could actually talk about what I was doing, learning and, and processing. And so I kind of made that connection that that's where I learned the most as a student. So I stopped trying to be the big professor and I was like, I'm just gonna help my students learn. And I don't have to be this big, great expert. That's fantastic. <laughs> and it changed everything. Yeah, no, I, I, that is, um, I, I think there's a point in which everybody who, who learns to love teaching makes that transition and, mm -hmm. and makes that leap into figuring out that that relationship with students is key, that they're not just some backdrop for your soliloquies, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Um, now that you're in the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, is there anything that you've noticed about how to teach politics uh, that is that seems particular, or or do you think that teaching is teaching? I don't know. I think teaching is teaching, but of course, we want to orient and socialize students to our discipline. And you know, I'm a comparativist. I teach comparative politics, which being comparativist, you know, com it's a methodology as well, mm -hmm. right? And so that's ingrained in all of my teaching um, is teaching them to actually be a comparativist. And so because of that, I think it's unique, but I would say um, I've learned so much from my colleagues. We sit around and have lunch together every day um, which I never imagined I would want to take the time to do actually or be able to 
but I found it's made me a better professor and faculty developer. So I've started investing the time in doing that. And I started getting jealous actually of my colleagues, my other faculty developer colleagues. I have a faculty member um, who's an English professor and I have another colleague who is a Americanist and studies, does interdisciplinary studies, teaches identity, fandom, cool things like that. Uh -huh. And when they would talk about their classes, they would just have this community in their class. Um, I could tell they had a dynamic that I never achieved. And I'm a warm person. I come down to their level. Why not? I couldn't understand. And I realized it's because I was approaching my teaching as a social scientist. And they were taking a more humanities and arts approach to mm. teaching. Um, and there was something about that that I realized they were able to build social capital in their class in a way that I had never done. And so um, I just sat down with them. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and one of my colleagues said, um, first day of class, I sit down with my students and I say, ask me anything. And basically I get them to ask me my story and I do it in a way that they can relate to. And then I do the same of them. Mm. And my English professor colleague, she teaches graduate students how to teach. Basically she teaches pedagogy classes online. And she said that when she started asking her students to um, share their stories as a student, as a TA, they started really engaging and building community in their class online in a way she had never seen before. And so I started asking my students to share their stories very specifically to the content of my class. So I teach comparative democratization and I started asking them to share their democracy story to help us um, unpack the lens and the frame through which we view democracy before then we can move on to consider other perspectives. And so I framed it in a content specific way. So it, my colleagues would think it was okay, but honestly, I was just trying to build community and social capital. And I have to tell you, it changed everything. So just giving myself permission to draw narrative into my class, I call it layered pedagogy. So I'm starting to layer the arts and the humanities into my approach. It's so different, um, especially with my minority students. So all of a sudden, lots of minority students started enrolling in my class in numbers I had never seen before. Words started getting out um, that I wanted to hear and see them and um, that they mattered to me. And so it was, I would have them come up to me, why don't other faculty do this? I actually feel like you care. And I wasn't being warm and fuzzy. I was just giving them space. Mm. Um, and they bonded in ways in my class with each other that learning improved. They did their work. They showed up, they took their quizzes, they were motivated. Um, they wanted to be accountable to me because of that sense of community and that mm -hmm. social capital. So there's just power in that. So I would say kind of to come back to full circle, clearly social capital has informed my teaching, which is, you know, a, a sociology or political science idea. Yeah. Um, but I'm drawing from the arts and humanities to help build it. Well, and, and so it's not just, sounds like it's not just you at their level, right? Mm -hmm. Getting down and, and relating to them, but encouraging them to build that network in the class as well, yeah. because they see each other as participants mm -hmm. in, the, in the exercise of the course. Absolutely. And again, I do that through art and narrative. So I, I do rich picture exercises for them to um, unpack and communicate to each other and me how they're going to do their research design where they actually have to draw it with pictures. We tell stories. I, I'll tell them, just tell the story of your country. Like they, they have a particular country they study the whole semester. And let's start with a story so that they can get in their own voice instead of adopting this mm. political science jargon that is not authentic to them and that usually is communicated in an awkward, weird way in their writing. And I find that getting them to do that 
together. So they draw pictures together, they communicate together. So weaving in this layered interdisciplinary approach really helps them connect with each other. Yeah, fascinating. And and not only that, but the, the idea of you're here, tell us a story, that's something they can take back to the to their dinner table at Thanksgiving dinner or, you know, with a roommate or something, they, mm-hmm. that's something that is, they can take that learning and the product of the knowledge they're building into their quote unquote real life. Yeah. And in interviews, you know, networking, um, it has real applications for them. Do you think as a comparativist and teaching comparative politics where they're exploring other countries, is there anything in particular about teaching American students that you've noticed or developed or learned? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's less so now, I would say, but it's still present, this idea of American exceptionalism and that we are the type of system and culture, frankly, to be emulated and replicated throughout the world. Um, And when we actually dig in and look at the data, um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, And so, at least in my class, it's exciting to see them kind of come in with this arrogance, if you will, Mm -hmm. and then spend time exploring the rest of the world and just see the richness um, that comes from other countries. Yeah. Um, so is there, have you learned anything um, in particular that you would pass along as advice to avoid in teaching? Is there anything you're, you've learned not to do? Yeah, to pretend I have all the answers. <laughs> I always tell my students, I'm still learning, we're learning together and I'm gonna learn from you. And um, it just takes the edge off and helps them feel like I'm accessible. And it's the truth. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Going to grad school, becoming a professor, I actually feel like I know, not that I know less, but I'm more aware of what I don't know. And so why pretend otherwise? Mm -hmm. Um, We've both acknowledged that this, last nine months is screwy um, and and hard. Um, Is there anything you've learned in particular about teaching that you're going to take forward from the kind of pandemic pedagogy stuff that we've all had to work through this year? Just to be aware of students as whole people and um, how the richness of that, what they bring to the class, what it means we can learn from each other but then also how important being mindful of their time and making what we do valuable is, mm. especially in this context. So I guess that brings it full circle to where we started. <laughs> this no, it's a, a, exactly yeah. right. I, it's, um, I'm hearing, and I, I don't know if you would characterize it this way, but this is a very student-centered pedagogy. Yes. It's not the content centered it's not a faculty centered it's a student centered pedagogy Mm -hmm. absolutely i actually think that came for me because i was teaching international relations to a you know 200 students at georgia tech my first um, faculty member position i was a part-time instructor and for some reason i was not thinking if I'm honest I had just gotten married came off my honeymoon walked into the classroom like two (laughs) days later and was looking up at all these students teaching them like they were political science students and they weren't they were engineers computer scientists um, mainly mathematicians you know and physicists and they did not understand what I was talking about (laughs) And I just realized that I have to know who my students are if they're going to learn anything. And that was a hard lesson I learned my first semester and it completely shaped my whole outlook on teaching. What kind of things have you been doing at the center that, um, that have been effective in helping people grab hold of that 
teacher identity. We actually do a lot of workshops on that, both for grad students and um, for faculty members. Um, actually, I run the new faculty orientation and with my colleague, Tracy Stromy at our center. And we've started actually with my English professor faculty as well, Linda Stewart, having faculty do narrative exercises in orientation. And so we have them share their stories about overcoming challenges, um, gratitude, what they want to create and be at the university in the year to come. And that kind of um, sharing their stories about their own professional identity and then kind of moving into sort of a collective community identity and what do we want to contribute <laughs> as this cohort mm -hmm. to the university um, is a very powerful exercise, both in building faculty belonging, but also helping them take the time to reflect. You know, we are so busy. We really need to take the time to slow down and reflect. And mm -hmm. we are faculty because we like thinking and reading and digging in and researching and reflecting and our profession is constructed in a such a way for many faculty that they don't even have the time or feel like they can take the time to do that it feels like we're cheating when in truth we will be so much better in our research and in our teaching if we do and that holds true for identity as well and continually mm -hmm. thinking about who do I want to be in my class how am I perceived is that how I want to be perceived um, is it effective? I think we can get on autopilot. And um, especially in times like this that are overwhelming, <laughs> it's helpful to really slow down. Um, it's certainly been the case for me that thinking, having to adjust teaching in to some students in the room and some students online and all that, that, that those adjustments that were forced upon me had me reflecting and getting out of older patterns and thinking about best ways to, to teach what, I, what I'm there for us to work on, you know? I think that's so true. I've talked to so many people and I know this is being covered by the media, but for many of us, this has been a time to really take stock of our lives and what matters and what we want to focus on, um, both professionally and personally. And um, I think it's been really valuable time mm -hmm. for that. I know with a lot of faculty I've been working with, they've been rethinking their teaching in that exact way you've described. I think it's going to change the academy, honestly. My colleagues in my department are spending more time together online, connecting. We have all these subgroups that we didn't used to have. Um, because of that yearning for connection, I think. And because of that, we're sharing more what's working, what's not working. And that's really exciting too. So reflecting together, I think is also a benefit of this. Wesley, thank you very much. I um, really appreciate taking the time to, to think through these things. In many ways, the perspective you have at the center is something that I hope that our discipline can really embrace. I, I think that we have the potential to be exemplary teachers in global politics, international studies, comparative politics. I think that there's ways that we can really connect to students. And so I, I am not surprised that the institution has recognized your ability to help connect in that in ways that help other faculty as well. Thank you. And I have to say, that's one reason I love ISA so much because I feel like they give me permission and validate sort of my interdisciplinary approach. And I haven't found that elsewhere. And so I just really appreciate that. And I look forward to um, connecting with other ISA members in the same way in the years to come face to face, I hope soon. <laughs> me too, that'd be great. As an extension of our conversation about slowing down and reflecting, Este wanted to recommend this book, The Slow Professor by Maggie Berg and Barbara Sieber. The book provides some context and some ways of framing what we do as professors and making time to make sure that we think about the foundational principles that lead us to be good ones. Thank you all for joining us. The Teaching Curve podcast is made available through the ISA Professional Resource Center under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association. 
You can send feedback or suggestions about future interviews to us on Twitter at Teaching Curve or by email teachingcurve at isanet.org. Thank you all again for tuning in. Remember, learn something every time you teach. See you next time on The Teaching Curve.